How many of you have seen the great theological movie, Forrest Gump? <laughs> yeah, it's a great movie. Many of you have seen it. Forrest Gump played by Tom Hanks. There's many great scenes. One of my favorite scenes is a touching scene. At the end, he's standing at Jenny's grave. And he says to, over the grave, speaking to his, his wife, Jenny, he says, I don't know if Mama is right or if it's Lieutenant Dan. I don't know if we all have a destiny or if we're all just floating around accidental like a feather on a breeze. But I think, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's both, he says. Maybe both are happening at the same time. It's an interesting theological question, isn't it? Do we all have a destiny or is our life going in a particular direction or is your life just this sort of a, a, accumulation of seemingly random events? Floating around, accidental, like a feather on a breeze. Our lives often do feel fairly random, don't they? We don't have a lot of control over the things that happen to us at times. It does feel like you don't know what's coming. You think you got it all planned out and life throws you a curveball. But if the Bible, the story of the Bible, particularly the story of Ruth, which we're studying together, tells us anything, it tells us that despite how it feels to you in a given moment, your life is not accidental. Your life is not the mere accumulation of random events. You are not floating around like a feather on a breeze. There are no pure accidents in the economy of God, even though it sometimes does feel like that if we're honest. Sinclair Ferguson, in his commentary on the book of Ruth, says this, the accidents of human history are actually the activities of God's providence in the world. What feels to us random is actually God working. How many of you can look back at your life and say, you know, I didn't see it, but it's no accident we moved there. It's no accident I met him or her. It's no accident she broke up with me. It's no accident I lost that job, whatever it was. Can you look back and see that? I can. Why can't we trust that we look forward then? If it's true in the rearview mirror, it's true looking forward as well. And I think one of the reasons God gave us this ancient story of Ruth is to teach us that. We're in the second half of chapter 2, the third part of the series. And just if you haven't been with us, give you a little, bring you up to speed. Naomi uh, is married to a man named Elimelech, has two sons, Malon and Kilion. They're Israelites living in Bethlehem. There's a famine and they leave. They leave the promised land looking for bread. They leave Bethlehem, the house of bread, because there is no bread in the house of bread. They shouldn't have left. That's God's promised land, but they did. And life gets almost unimaginably tragic for them. Elimelech dies. Over the next 10 years, she loses her husband and her two sons. She's left with two Moabite daughter-in-laws. Moab was not friends with Israel. There was great animosity. There's a long history there. Moabite women were viewed as stealing, leading astray Israelite men. This is not how her life, she thought it would turn out. She pleads with her daughters-in-law to go back. One named Orpah does. One named Ruth, who the book is named for. Think of that, a book in the Bible named for a Moabite woman. Doesn't says, I'm not leaving you. And they make their way back to Bethlehem because there's a harvest beginning. Bread now coming back to the house of bread. And in chapter 2, we see that they're there. They don't have anybody. They just have each other. Think about Ruth's life. Ruth leaves her family, her heritage, her religion, her culture to cling to this woman. When they get there, Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. That means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because my life has turned bitter from my loss. So how would you like to be Ruth, where your only friend in a foreign land is a bitter mother-in-law? One morning she says, I'm going to go out and look for favor. Specifically, she means someone who will let me glean. Gleaning was like an Old Testament um, welfare system. The landowners were required by law to leave the edges and the corners of their fields unharvested so the poor people could come and pick up the edges and maybe get some scraps that fell behind from the workers, enough to survive on. Many foreign nations had this similar kind of law. What made Israel unique is they also made a provision not just for their own poor, but for foreigners. That was utterly unique in the ancient world. So here's Ruth looking for someone who will obey the law of God and let her glean. She finds favor in a man named Boaz. I like saying his name, Boaz. It's sort of, you have to like force it out, Boaz. Everybody say Boaz together. It's a good name. Look for a name for a son. It's a good and strong name for a boy. 
So let's read the last couple of verses of chapter 2, and we'll see how, where we left off last week. Boaz has been more than generous to her, done more than the law required, and she can't believe it. And she says, why have you done this? And here's how he answers, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse, thir- uh, verse 11. Boaz answered her, all you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. That's how in the, the, when Boaz meets her, he comes back from Bethlehem at just that moment. Again, no accidents. He meets her. Some time passes between that verse 13 and verse 14, where we'll pick up in a minute. So there's like a pregnant pause in the story. The author of Ruth is a great storyteller. He meets her. He blesses her. She says, why have you treated me this way? He says, I, I know what kind of woman you are. Now, we find out later he's interested in her too, but he's being kind to her. And she works and gleans all day. And then comes time for the afternoon meal. A break. Let's pick it up in verse 14. We'll read just through 16. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Now, it's easy to miss. There's a lot of stuff going on beneath the surface in these few verses. This is much more than just a meal. She's being invited to the table of the landowner. They'd be in the fields, put up a makeshift shelter for shade, a low table there. All the the workers and the foremen would come to eat. She's not even a servant. She's a foreigner, poor person who would not be invited in. He invites her under the shade, under the covering, to his table. The master, the Lord of the harvest, is inviting the foreign widow to his table. That's shocking. And they, he, he, he lets her eat from his table. He says, dip your bread in the wine vinegar. How many of you have been to a really good Italian restaurant in your life? All of your hands should be going up. Just last night, we were on a retreat with our executive council and our church board talking about our future as a church and discussing many important issues. And we ate last night at the end of our retreat uh, at a really nice restaurant together. Or was it like, no, it was two nights ago. I don't know what night it was. Friday night. It was good. That's all I'm telling you. And they brought out the bread. There's a comedian I like named Jim Gaffigan who talks about when you go out to eat, suddenly you love bread. You don't eat bread like that at home. When you go out to a restaurant, it's like, they have bread here? I love bread. <laughs> They bring the bread, and it's amazing, right? The good, warm bread. And they bring the dishes full of oil and vinegar and Parmesan cheese and pepper, and you just start dipping the bread. And you eat the bread and more bread. And then an hour passes, and they bring your entree, and you're stuffed, right? Oh, I forgot I even ordered that thing. And you can't finish it. Well, if you're me, you can finish it. But if you're you, I'm trying not to finish everything. Anyway, the point is, that's what's in my mind when you look at this story. Come to my table, and she's dipping the bread, and she's eating her fill. This is a woman who doesn't have food, hoping to get enough grain to make a meal for her and her mother-in-law. They got nothing. And she eats so much, she's stuffed, and she has leftovers, leftovers for a starving widow. This is shocking. And then Boaz does something even more shocking. It's time to go back to work for the rest of the day. He pulls aside his men, and he says something to them, which we could easily miss. He goes, let her glean among the sheaves. Huh? Don't even reproach her, and even more, pull some out from the bundles and leave it for her. You might just gloss right over that. This is shocking behavior. What are sheaves? You'll see an image here on the screen. These are sheaves of barley grain stacked up, the bundles he's referring to. This is a picture of the prophet of the landowner. The whole point is to plant, water, fertilize, cultivate, grow the grain, to harvest it, and to sell it to make money. So he's say, the law said, you have to let the poor pick up the scraps that you miss and gather from the edges. It doesn't say anything about letting them into your profits. This is his business. He says to his own men, let her, don't treat her like a foreigner or a poor person where she's in the back, following way behind, picking up the scraps. Let her walk, work right next to you, right where you are among my prophets. As a matter of fact, pull some out for her and give it to her. This is shocking. 
It's meant to be a picture of God's grace, lavish, far beyond what's required, far beyond what we deserve. It's what he gives us. Boaz is doing something for her that was unheard of. This is the landowner's prophet being given to the foreign widow. He's not treating her like a foreigner. He lets her at his table. He feeds her by his own hand. He serves her. He lets her work among his people. He's treating her like family, like one of his own. When I was in Africa with my wife a couple of years ago, uh, in visiting one of our hospitals, in the, one of our cure hospitals in Zambia that we support, and we met a man named Harold Hamumba and his wife, Na. Harold is the spiritual director of the hospital, caring for both the staff and the patients. M- remarkable guy. He's from the Bemba tribe. His wife, Na, is from the Tonga tribe. And Harold said, our marriage is kind of a picture of the gospel because the Bembas and the Tongas historically have had some hostility. He says, as a matter of fact, when we started this hospital, the Bemba's the workers were in control. And the hospital, the, the white European and American doctors were coming training Zambian nationals to be doctors. But it was a big deal to get trained by the white American and European doctors. And so the Bemba's were le- excluding the Tongans from having that access. Because there was, there was a hierarchy. There was a history. But they're Christians. Harold said it took a lot of preaching and convincing and the grace of God to finally get it through to them. He says one of the greatest days in the history of our hospital is when the first Tongan became a doctor. The point is, for the Christ follower, our call is not give a little extra, not from your profits, of course, not from your own security, but give a little extra to those poor people, to them, because they're so needy. Treat them as if they're one of you, is the point. As if they're one of your own. It's very, it's very easy for us to treat people that are different from us, have less than us, as other than us, and feel good about giving a little bit. That's not the picture here. The picture is amazing grace, welcoming her as one of his own. Let's pick up the story in verse 17. Verse 17 So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned until it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. Seems very straightforward, but this is also very shocking. Naomi, or Ruth, I mean, leaves that morning with nothing, hoping to get enough for a meal. She comes back with an ephah of barley. What's an ephah? Well, it's about a quarter to half a bushel. That doesn't really help much, does it? What's an ephah? It is roughly 30 to 40 pounds of threshed out grain. A 30 to 40 pound sack of grain. The average ration for an ancient field worker in this time was two to three pounds. She has somewhere in the neighborhood of two to two and a half weeks wages in one day. And by the way, Ruth must be a pretty strong woman. Maybe there was like more CrossFit in the ancient world or something because you ever try to, you ever lug 30-pound sack around miles back to your home after working in the fields all day and threshing out the grain? And she's carrying her leftovers. How many of you ever like try to un- unload the groceries from the back of the car and try to get all the bags at once? Every finger loop, you know, with all the bags and all the stuff and just carry it all in. I never make it, right? She's carrying 30 to 40 pounds of grain and her leftover food all the way home after a full day's work literally loaded down with the blessing of God. It's shocking. And Naomi sees her coming. Can you imagine being Naomi? You're at home, wherever they're living, in a hovel, all day, worried. My daughter-in-law, is she okay? Remember there's these references where where Boaz has to tell his men, don't harass her, don't hurt her. And her mother-in-law will say later, stay in the fields where they're good to you and kind to you. Because... Not everybody is. In other words, it's a 50-50 proposition at best that she doesn't get abused or mistreated. Now, Naomi's waiting. Is she okay? Is is there going to be any food? And she's coming back, and she's staggering under the weight of what God's done. It's an amazing picture. Remember the last time we saw Naomi? Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Bitter. She's going from bitterness to blessedness right before our eyes in this story. 
And Lorene a moment ago talked about some of you who maybe have some sadness this time of year, some sorrow, maybe not even related to your mother. Maybe you just, you're just in a, you feel weighed down. Could it be that your present sorrow and even bitterness, in the midst of them, God is preparing for your blessing and for his glory? Could it be that actually your pain and struggle and sorrow right now is preparing you for what he's going to do? I think the story teaches us that it is so. Let's read verses 19 and 20. If you'd like to highlight or underline, these two verses are the kind of the fulcrum on which the whole rest of the story of Ruth turns. Verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. And Naomi said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. These two verses are the turning point of the whole story, as I said. Naomi asks, Where'd you get that? But she specifically asked in a particular way. She said, Who took notice of you? Did you catch that? Who took notice of you? That's a very important phrasing by the author. Who not just physically saw that you were in the field, but saw you, like really saw you, noticed you, and blessed you, and cared for you. You ever walk into a room and feel invisible? You ever felt invisible in your life? I mean, nobody really sees. I mean, they see me, and I do a pretty good job of covering covering things up, but they don't see. They don't really know what's going on. I remember years ago, a man that I had gotten to know in our church, came, I saw him, I said, hey, how are you doing today? And he goes, you really want to know? It's a Sunday morning. And I was like, uh, I think so. <laughs> and he went on to tell me about a deeply broken marriage, all kinds of relational pain. I had no idea. We'd been surface friends for years. But he decided on the way in, he said, I'm not pretending anymore. And he, and he unloaded Who sees? Who knows? Who notices? Really notices. In fact, there's a story in Genesis 16 about a woman named Hagar who feels like nobody notices her, not even God. And God meets her in the wilderness and blesses her. And she says, blessed be the Lord. And she calls him El Roy. Not El Roy, but El Roy. Meaning the God who sees me. One of the things that Ruth teaches us is God sees. God sees you. He notices you. You're not invisible to him. He sees what's going on when you pretend and nobody else knows. And he cares. He sees you in your sorrow. Now, we know that 30 to 40 pounds of grain and leftover, you know, macaroni grill is not the whole story. It's just the beginning of what God's going to do in in their lives. There's much more coming. They don't know that. I mean, this is a blessing enough, right? Because think about it for just a minute. Ruth knows Boaz's name, but she doesn't really know who he is. Naomi knows there's this relative we have named Boaz, but she doesn't know where Ruth's been all day. The convergence of these two pieces of information form the blessing of God in their lives the rest of the story. Because, and the author does something very, very intentional, and I read it as a joke on purpose, because he saves the, the revelation of the name for the very last word of chapter 19, or verse 19. The name of the man in whose field I worked today is, can you hear the music building, you know, the drama? Boaz. Oh! Because what is, and you know, we don't get this yet, but you will. Naomi is shocked because this is one of the few people alive on the planet who could do more than just give us a meal, who could redeem us. Now, there's two words in verse 20 I want you to notice and underline and highlight and circle. Uh, we're going to unpack them in a the, in the, in the couple weeks to come. But they're critical for this story, and they're really critical understanding really the gospel in our own story of redemption. The first word is in verse 20, and if you could flash it back up, that'd be great. I know I passed by it a while ago. She said, who has shown you kindness. It's the word kindness. Right there at the bottom. Blessed be the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living of the dead. The word kindness in Hebrew is the word hesed. But you can't say hesed in good Hebrew unless you sound like you're coughing something up with the H. So I want you to say hesed and make the person in front of you feel that you said it. Ready? Chesed. 
Chesed, right? <laughs> Sorry for those of you in the front row. It, 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 it's hard to translate into English. This simple little Hebrew word is a profound theme throughout this entire Old Testament. It, it does, kindness doesn't do it justice. It's not kind or nice or sweet. It, it means the deep, deep goodness of God seen in his faithfulness to his own promises, his covenant love, his loving kindness, the fact that you can count on him to be good and make good on what he said he would do. Despite the fact that we rebel and reject and forget and go our own way, God's chesed love will not fail. Naomi is saying, I've been through some stuff and I see now that God is not failing us. He has not abandoned us. And how does she see it? She sees it in this man. This is the guy. One of the few alive who could do this for us. And the next word is what he could do. It's the word redeemer. You see it in verse 20? Guardian, kinsman, redeemer. Your Bible might say one of our redeemers. Kinsman, redeemer. Guardian, redeemer. It's the same Hebrew phrasing. And we will get into this in future weeks. But what it means basically is this. The Old Testament law to help widows and people who were abandoned or mistreated and had no recourse set up a system by which a male relative of means had the opportunity and responsibility to do something to save them. Either pay a debt they owe they can't pay, buy back land they've lost and give it to them, marry a widow who's been widowed and has no provision, or seek justice for a crime committed against them. All of that wrapped up in this idea of guardian redeemer, kinsman redeemer. Naomi is saying, one of the few people who could save us, who could do this for us, who could not just give us some food, but give us a whole new life, a whole new life, is the very guy in whose field you worked. There are no accidents in God's economy. Nothing's left to chance. Well, again, we'll come back to that those ideas in the future. But can you begin to see now how these two concepts, God's faithfulness to his own promises, his hesed love, his kindness, and a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer who could save you, pay your debt, buy you back, bring you into his family, how those things come together in the gospel. How that's a, the story of Ruth is a great love story, but it's inside of a bigger love story. God's hesed love for us. Boaz the man is a picture of the man Jesus Christ our kinsman redeemer. But again, I don't want to give too much away. We have to wait for that. In fact, the story ends on a rather eh note. <laughs> At least chapter 2. Let me read verse uh, 23 to you. You can put those verses up there. 23, just 23. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. <laughs> really? Like, come on, Boaz, she's right there. You know where this is going. Like, duh, she, and she lived with her mother-in-law. But there's more coming. What I want to do is finish with this. I want, I want to unpack for you very briefly what I will call the gospel according to Boaz. The gospel, the good news of God according to this man Boaz. How do we see? Because one of the reasons the story of Ruth is given to us is that we would see the character of God on display in the characters in this story. Boaz and Ruth are showing us something of the character of God. And I want to walk through that with you briefly. Four, four things. The first thing, he treats the foreigners as his family. She works alongside his people. She drinks from the same water as his men. She sits at his own table. He serves her by his own hand. She's not treated like an outsider or a foreigner. She's treated like one of the family. Number two, he protects the vulnerable under his wings. Ruth is vulnerable. She's vulnerable to mistreatment, abuse, or worse. And Boaz protects her, treats her with dignity. Number three, he feeds the hungry at his table. He doesn't just give and keep at arm's length. He welcomes in, feeds the hungry at his own table. It's a powerful thing to eat with somebody, to welcome them into your house. It's the heart of the neighborhood church we talk about. It's one thing to give to the poor out there. It's another to bring them into your home, sit at your own table, and feed them in fellowship. And then number four, he showers the needy with his grace. Boaz goes way beyond what's required. <laughs> you know, when, 
When I was a student, I used to want to know from the syllabus, what's the minimum requirement to pass? <laughs> what do I have to do to stay eligible? Right? That's not the message here. He goes far beyond what's required, which is what grace is. Do you see the character of God and Jesus Christ and those things? He welcomes the foreigner as family. Paul says, you and I were strangers, foreigners, and aliens, cut off from God, and were welcomed as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, into his family. He welcomes you and feeds you at his table, the table of the Lord. He protects you, and he showers you with his grace, just pours it out on you. You see the connection? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. This is God's w law to the Old Testament people, Israel, but it's to us as well. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner. That's the word for foreigner. Giving him food and clothing. Loving the so, so you love the sojourner, therefore, because you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. In other words, in the Old Testament, he's saying you were strangers and foreigners in Egypt. God showered you with his grace, rescued you out of that land, brought you through the wilderness, into the promised land, is pouring out his grace on you now. So how can you now, with foreigners among you, act like, you, like you're all that? You were them. And they are you. And to us, in the church, it says the same thing. Now, I am not unaware that there are uh, debates raging in our country about how our government should handle foreigners and immigrants. And there are good, thoughtful reasons to have differing opinions. I want to say this clearly, because it was misunderstood last hour. I'm not talking about that. You all hear? I'm not talking about the political view you might have on immigration. I'm talking about your heart as a follower of Jesus Christ for foreigners, for people who are different, other than you. God has designed that his people should reflect his heart. And if Ruth tells us anything, it tells us his heart is for people who have no home, who have no place, who have no food. That's his heart. So when you meet somebody who seems like they're not from here, is your first thought, are you here legally? Or is your first thought, how can I love you? How can I serve you? Again, there's a whole other conversation to have about immigration. I'm talking about your heart for the foreigner and the stranger living among you. Here's how it works from, from in my life too often. I bet for you as well. I tend to think, and I bet you do, you know, when I, when I get this paid off, when we get the kids out of college, when I get this settled financially, then I'll be more generous. Then I really want to be more generous. But it's, you know, it's out there. I got to get there first. And then when you get there, it's like, well, I didn't anticipate this bill, and now we have this obligation. So when I get, you know, to this point, then I'll be more generous. Don't misunderstand me. We already took the offering. I'm not trying to guilt anybody into giving here. I'm just talking about our hearts, right? Here's the thing. It's a lie. It never comes. It's the ever receding horizon. It's always out there. You never get there. There's always another reason why, well, when I get there, when I get there. We think once I get to X, I'll be free to be generous. And it's a lie. The Bible says, actually, the path to freedom is to give your life away on behalf of the poor and the fatherless. The path to Imprisonment, enslavement, bitterness, selfishness is to think I have to get to a certain security point first. I'm going to read to you from the prophet Isaiah to finish because it's a beautiful picture of what true freedom looks like, what God's people are meant to look like. You know, we're reading the story of Ruth. Why? To get a picture of the heart of God. Do you know there are people in the world that are reading the story of your life right now? What picture of God are they getting? When they look at us as a church, what picture of God are they getting? Well, look at my life. What picture of God are they getting from Pastor Jeff's life? I want it to be, they walk away going, well, whatever else those crazy Christians believe, they must think God is radically generous and kind and compassionate. Because look at what, how they live. Is that the picture they get? I think increasingly it is for us, but we have some work to do. I do. I'm guessing you do. Let me read to you the prophet Isaiah. God speaking to his people then and now. Is not this the fast that I choose? 
to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then shall you call the Lord, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, the speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. When? When will we be like this? When will, be, when will we be a light to the world and like a well-watered garden and secure and safe? When? When we finally save enough and, you know, get the 401k straight and pay off our debts. No. When you spend your life for other people, when you give yourself away, then the world will see. Then you'll know true freedom. Friends, I'm preaching to myself as much as to you. I don't always live this way, but I want to. And I want us to. Let's stand for closing prayer. Lord God, your has said love, your kindness on display to us in the man Jesus Christ is beyond comprehension, beyond what we deserve, beyond what we could earn, and yet you pour out your grace. You've redeemed us. We who were foreigners and strangers and aliens, spiritually speaking, you call us sons and daughters. And you set us loose in the world that we might be a picture, a display for those who don't know your loving kindness, that by our lives, the world would see what you're like. Forgive us because we fall short. Strengthen us because we want to live and love the way you have loved us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, our Redeemer and our Rock. We pray in your name. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, friends, and go in peace.